JD, or if you leave the hat there, I'll just have you in some sense redundant, but let me just put it there to uh, remind you. This thing is a function of V, and uh, its square is, of course, what's going to show up in the denominator. Well, we know what that shift is because this thing. Well, in order to find the residue of that pool, what we really want to do is fit 
basically as close to that pole as possible and maybe think about running a little contour angle around the distance of delta from the pole. But basically we want to go sit on the pole and look at the coefficient of the singularity. We know, of course, that um, it's linear, the propagator is, is linear in this squared momentum, so it's a linear pole, so the singularity is z minus dAv, and we want to look at the coefficients of that, uh, that singularity. Well, we, uh, so we know what happens when you approach a pole. We get a factorization of the amplitude. And this is no longer at the level of a single diagram, which may or may not be true. Um, this is at the level of the amplitude, we're coming over all the diagrams. So we know that as we approach the pole here, we're not just getting very close to the pole, kind of the usual factorization. We really want to sit on top of the pole. So we're going to have a singularity here. We're going to look and ask, what is its coefficient? Well, its coefficient. There's a left amplitude, and there's a right amplitude. So as we're sitting on the pole, then the amplitude, A and Z, is going to factorize. We're going to see a left amplitude corresponding to the famous case in terms of AO. And there's going to be a right amplitude, and then there's going to be the singularity. Here is we're not getting just closer, we really want to sit right on top of it. So, okay, so what about the residue? Well, um, of course, that momentum is not going to be flowing through either of these two, so there's no multiple poles. That's, of course, consistent with the fact that in state theory, we, we get a single pole here. We don't get this thing cubed or the power or square or anything. It's a single pole. Right? There'd be trouble with the mechanical, otherwise, the single particle state. So, and we get the, the pole from here, so basically we just need to extract the, the overall factors. We put these factors at the pole, so we're going to get DAD, AL, and AR, DAD. And uh, we can pull out a uh, factor, so this is DAB, coming from the fact that our original integral, we're not just putting the residue of A, we're looking at the residue of A of Z divided by Z. So that's where the DAB is coming from. And um, this form is, of course, not of the form Z minus Z pole, so we just want to pull out this factor in front, so Z minus A, AD. And finally, there's the pole. And of course, if we were the Lorentz expansion as other terms, but we're not interested in them because they, they end up being right. Well, so the residue now is very simple. Take the loss of some factors of i here. The residue is very simple uh, to take because uh, we just take the coefficient of the terminal rock expansion. Here, there we are. And uh, the other thing we can notice is that CAD times this denorial complex product. Well, that actually shows on the denominator, so that product is uh, remarkably enough just the naive momentum flowing through that channel. The unshifted momentum flowing through that channel. That thing, of course, is nowhere near a pole. It's just some momentum invariant squared, some non-zero quantity. But it's, it's the naive thing flowing through there. So that's the residue. And um, that's, that's it. So notice that, of course, we had to factorize at least two legs on one side. We have to have at least a three-point amplitude here. So each of these amplitudes, AL and AR, has fewer external legs than our original amplitude. So we've, we've written an amplitude in terms of an on-shell object that has fewer external legs. And of course, we can iterate this procedure. And also, they get down to something that just has three-point amplitude in it. And I'll show you a simple example of how that works in time out. The only twist is that these have to be evaluated in complex values of the external momentum. So they're not the original external momentum. They're shifted, shifted into the complex plane by some amount to determine it. By, by this equation. And uh, we can, uh, diagrammatically, if we imagine, for example, that J and L are in minus 1 and n, then uh, we can write this identity, this recursion relation, on shell recursion relation, in the uh, following form. We can label some of the legs, leave the others unlabeled. So this is uh, a simple form where I am taking the two to be adjacent, although there's no, that it's not uh, necessary. So now I'm just going to have a linear a number of legs, which in practice that's generally a good thing to do because it minimizes the number of terms, but essentially it's not special. So we're going to write that in terms of lower point uh, amplitudes that have the product of each term as a product of two lower point amplitudes and I use propagator. Of course, the thing that I haven't mentioned, but that you have to do, you always have to sum over all possible uh, internal states that can be there. And in our case, even if we're looking at tier one, that means we go positive and negative velocity. And uh, the one subtlety is that all these amplitudes, because we're looking at a crossing in the cross language, where everything is uh, nothing goes to n, that means that when the momenta are directed outwards over here and outwards over here, it means they're going opposite directions. Remember, when you flip the sign of the momentum, you're also flipping the velocity. So the velocities that you're summing over are opposite. Actually, I guess it's equal to uh, I is equal to 1, and it goes up to uh, n minus 3. So to start with,
you're having a three point amplitude over here, the ends and left hand of the sun have a three point amplitude over there. These are optional amplitudes with the uh, external legs uh, shifting into the complex plane. And uh, we'll come back and uh, discuss this a little bit more and do an example, and also do a little bit more discussion of uh, factorization uh, tomorrow afternoon. But if there are any urgent questions on, I know I've run over, if there are urgent questions on the BCSW relations, then now is the time to ask them. Um, that's just tracking through time. When you actually uh, plug this back into. Uh, to
I want to get at my best. I think what is worth so much time for so many people. So I want to talk about the highlights of the three phases of cervical APD epidemiology that I've explored. And a few important lessons I've learned spending my entire working life at NIH. Then run that to scholar and talk. And please just look at the Lancet seminar we did in 2007, which is still true, showing that we didn't um, make too many mistakes then, but uh, for a more up to date thing, we just put out the nature reviews, this disease primer. And uh, that's, that'll give you more details. So I went to Mexico with an epidemiologist, not the other way around. Uh, Paul Foley was my mentor at that time. I had wanted to do epidemiology since I was an anthro major, and I wanted to do good. And I liked statistics, like most people did. So I uh, spent a year in West Africa studying suspicious I worked for APHA's Office of International Health. I went to the Public Health Service, uh, Office of Public Health at Parkland, and then I applied to Johns Hopkins to do a PhD in International Health in Wisconsin. I met with a dean, and he said, uh, you're a policy guy. I can tell that you're a policy guy, that you have a lot of things you want to achieve. And um, right now, MDs control international health in most of the, of the world. And I'm not going into my program. You'd be unhappy. Which really presented that. And um, right, I went to med school, ultimately. I um, went to be an epidemiologist all the whole time. This was an odd way to address everything. What's the evidence for this? We're doing so many tests with the chance of uh, being a false positive and other things that led to in different grades while I was in med school. So then I did an internship. And um, I wanted to get an MPH, but everything had been shut down. All the preventive medicine things had been shut down uh, by the current administration. And, but there was the Public Health Service Epi training program. And that was my last hope of getting an MPH paid for. We were starting to have kids. And so these guys actually hired me. And uh, two of them were in the audience. And I thanked them for that. Because I don't know what I would have done. I had also applied to be a family doc and an ER doctor at the same time. And that's, that's the reason I'm here. And I've never left. So, I don't know. Known Dr. Gordon, uh, I don't know how many other people actually knew Dr. Gordon at all. How many people here knew? I can't really tell, but um, he would lecture sometimes and then convene the SEPI training program. And I want to say that he taught me an important lesson. And that sometimes he would fall asleep while we were lecturing, while we were giving our little talks. He seemed a little bit disengaged sometimes, and I attributed it to his age, which is younger. He's out of 59, younger than I am now. And then I realized he never complained, never said anything that he was dying of cancer. And when I found that out, I was like, Damn, you know, this guy is really dedicated because he, he knows he's dying and he's still coming to these, you know, these kids talk. And uh, I thank him for that lesson and for his dedication and uh, what he's talking. So uh, I studied one thing for 30 years, despite the advice from senior investigators, that I should switch it out. I remember uh, I started with four things and I decided to study HPV because what I wanted to do was make impact. I consider myself a preventive medicine doctor and a scientist, but I want impact. So I have gotten variety for folks. And what that means is I've been doing exactly the same thing in the same place for 30 some years, for almost 35 years. But it's like a microscope. You focus down. First you look at the, the tissue. Then you do low mag and you see certain things. So you get high magnification, you start to see cellular features. You go to electron microscopy, all of a sudden you're looking at viral stuff. And if you do special stains, you get more insight. And what I found is as we click down to a greater and greater understanding of cervical cancer and HPV, all new vistas open up. It really is like different fields, different fields, different fields. And there's a richness of a continuing story that I'm tremendously interested in. And also the sense that each time we're rediscovering a level of detail that we'll, of course, I'll never get to the end of now, I know. Now we're down to the individual isolated whole genome, and there's a whole new world out there that's redefining a lot of what we thought we knew. I realize there's no end to it. And, uh, but I remember a few more, uh, well, I think Dr. Jablon actually told me once, um, he was an investigator working late to his 70s or something in radiation. And I asked him, what's this going all these years that you're still working when you retire? And he said, find, a, find something you're interested in, make it your own, be curious, and do it as if you don't even care if you're paid. And I found that, and I'm still committed until uh, until they me up. So I want to talk about the distinct phases of HPD epidemiology, which has changed around me as we learn more and more. First, we were based after uh, Zernhausen discovered uh, the connection with the natural history of HPD and cervical carcinogenesis, we did etiology. Then we used some of those biomarkers and started to make them into methods of prevention. And then we uh, entered the time to actually get people to use those methods. And that's the seven implementation. And all of the goal of global cervical cancer control, because my heart is in international health. So, etiology and natural history. I remember being so excited as we were learning the story that I didn't even know what city I was in. We'd be on a bus uh, at some point, and we'd be, well, each year had some discovery that was making it more and more profoundly interesting. 
And the team, the group, there was probably about five epidemiologists at the first meeting to now there's thousands of people coming to the meeting. We were so excited, we were like, where am I? What group? You know, it's just like, you just learned this, you just learned that. What a wonderful thrill it's been to get a sense of a team that was exploring that together. But what I learned is that no one remembers who discovered what, even 10 years later. You can, like, attribute it to the first person who wrote it.